The case studies that we're going to overview in this chapter are Cattle Point Urban Star Park that's located in Oak Bay, British Columbia, Canada, Jasper National Park that's located in Jasper, Alberta, Canada, the town of Bon Accord located in Alberta, Canada, and Mont Megantic, which is an observatory and park that's located in Quebec, Canada. So the first case study that I'm going to discuss is Cattle Point Park. It's an urban star park in Oak Bay, British Columbia, which is designated through the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Cattle Point was designated in 2003, and it's actually Canada's second urban star park that was designated by RASP. Canada actually only has two urban star parks. One of them is on the East Coast, and Kettle Point's located on the West Coast. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which is the Victoria chapter, they were the people that submitted the application for the urban star park. Oak Bay is an area that is part of the greater Victoria region on Vancouver Island, and they are committed to using dark sky friendly lighting at this park or using no lighting at all. So I have a definition here of the vision for Kettle Point Park. And the vision for the park is a place for residents and tourists, old and young alike, to enjoy the stars, planets, our moon, meteor showers, satellites, and the International Space Station. A unique location where there is minimal light pollution, a place to think about our planet and its place in the universe, and the importance of how to care for the Earth, a place for students, young and old, to dream. So it's really interesting is that Cattle Point actually has a number of events and initiatives at the park. So this could be a student summer camp, monthly star watching events, a meteor shower viewing, constellation planet photography groups, and it's just in general, it's in a place for the Oak Bay Astronomy Club to meet. Cattle Point is occupied more regularly in the summer as the park hosts many astronomy events there. And local astronomers have used Kettle Point to set up telescopes and provide community outreach. So as you can probably remember, I mentioned that education is a key point of having a dark sky site. So this is a, also a big part of maintaining an urban star park would be having a active community outreach program. So during my interviews where I asked Kettle Point about becoming an urban star park, I asked them a question about crime and safety. So what I was told was that there were minimal concerns that Kettle Point would have increased crime and safety since becoming an urban star park. And because the urban star park is actually close to a busy roadway, it's used by many tourists and locals, and actually the police go by the area regularly, especially if there's a special event. So crime has really never been much of a problem here. There's also a 24-7 access requirement that is needed for an urban star park, and that's kind of one of the common concerns that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada states is that many people are hesitant to enact a dark sky site because they're worried about this 24-7 access. But I asked Kettle Point what they thought about the access being 24-7, and they said that it wasn't actually a concern with the city council and that Kettle Point Park was wanting to be a dark sky site for about 15 years prior to its actual designation. I also asked if there were issues with city council approving the site becoming a dark sky site, and it was about over 15 years ago that the council was approached about setting up an urban star park. So what the council did is they made many lighting changes to accommodate a dark sky and better viewing for local astronomers. So this dark sky idea has really spread throughout the Oak Bay region one year after its designation. And the council has reduced lighting and has more knowledge now about the hazards associated with outdoor lighting. So you can see here that a dark sky site is actually a really great way to actually create further education for municipalities, especially the city council, to find ways to limit light pollution in the community. I asked if a bylaw was needed as well to designate the Urban Star Park. So Cattle Point actually has no official bylaw as the park was already protected for its endangered native plant species. And Oak Bay is really proud of this effort of protecting the ecosystems at the park. And the Urban Star Park designation definitely strengthens this ecological aspect of Cattle Point. So as I was talking about in the last course, how many lights have to be retrofitted from high pressure sodium to LED, I asked if urban, the Urban Star Park at Kettle Point had to retrofit their lights. So the answer was that no lights have actually been retrofitted at Kettle Point because there are already few street lights there to begin with. And one of the reasons that Kettle Point was already selected as an Urban Star Park is because it's located on a prominent point that projects onto the coastline, which puts water around more than half of the area. So the park is already dark to the northeast direction to begin with. Kettle Point's also a heavily treed area, so the park is shielded away from the road and street lighting, so it really makes it a perfect location for an Urban Star Park. Another common concern about designating a dark sky site is actually the budget. So in regard to Kettle Point, there were no fees actually after becoming an urban star park except for incorporating park signage. The budgeting was not challenging, it was more about finding the proper site. 
writing a strong proposal, and creating a wide-scale plan for the Urban Star Park. So the biggest expense was actually the park kiosk sign, and the design was done by a professional illustrator. So the goal of the kiosk was to give an explanation about the ecological and environmental importance of an urban star park, and it also states that an urban star park is not primarily intended for astronomical observation only. Furthermore, what's interesting is the information on the kiosk, there's a section about controlling light at night, and there's sky charts of what astronomical events and constellation can be viewed from Cuddle Point. So as you probably realize that urban star parks and dark sky sites are actually quite novel, they're interesting, so there, there is a tourism draw there as well. So Cuddle Point has become a tourism destination since becoming an urban star park, and there's many events that are on tourism handouts and bus tours that stop around the coast that visit the park. The next dark sky site that I will discuss is Jasper, Alberta. So Jasper's National Park is a Royal Astronomical Society of Canada designated dark sky preserve. So that's quite different than the urban star park designation at Cuddle Point. So here are some quick facts that I'm going to provide about the dark sky preserve at Jasper. So Jasper National Park is the second largest dark sky preserve in the world, which is very interesting. Jasper National Park is approximately 11,000 square kilometers and the beauty of the parks in Jasper their dark sky can be viewed 365 days of the year. So Jasper really embraces its identity as a dark sky town. So everyone with this idea, they were all in and were really excited about becoming a dark sky town. So what's interesting about Jasper is they offer Aboriginal dark sky stories, sidewalk astronomy, they have telescopes on the streets, and there's moonlight hikes and ghost stories. So rather than just having the national park as an entire dark sky site, there's many incentives and many very interesting things that you can do with the dark sky theme. So what makes Jasper different than any other town is that the town has a unique governing process. So why it is unique is because Jasper is actually located in a national park. And originally Jasper used to be governed by the federal government. Jasper became a specialized municipality in 2001 because it is situated in a national park and it's governed by Parks Canada. So Jasper has a unique governing process as Parks Canada retains authority over land use, development, and environmental issues. So a dark sky preserve in Jasper National Park was actually initiated by Parks Canada. And the idea behind it was that a dark sky preserve would be perfect as Parks Canada and Jasper thought it would be beneficial to provide dark sky education and protect night ecology. There was also a lot of great potential for tourism with a dark sky preserve. And also experiential tourism could be beneficial to learn about nature and wildlife in the park. There was lots of effort put into Jasper's tourism industry to attract people to the dark sky preserve. One of the biggest events that Jasper has is the annual Dark Sky Festival in October, and they've even had guests as prominent as Bill Nye, the science guy. So like Kettle Point, in my interviews, I asked what were some of the processes that occurred for Jasper to become a Dark Sky Preserve? So to become a Dark Sky Preserve, an application was sent to RASC, and it took one year for this application. There were other commitments as well that were required that went beyond typical Dark Sky Preserves because Dark Sky Preserves typically don't have towns located within them. So a Dark Sky Preserve normally would be kind of standing on its own as its own separate park, but because the town of Jasper is situated, as I mentioned, through Parks Canada already in a national park, that the Dark Sky Preserve has a town in it, which is very unique. So Jasper had to commit to efficient lighting principles and help residents and businesses improve their lighting. It was very challenging for the town of Jasper to have a residents and businesses owner switch their lights to Dark Sky Lighting, and Jasper is unable to write a bylaw because it actually doesn't have authority as development is controlled through Parks Canada. And because Parks Canada does not have bylaws, instead they have national park regulations. So these regulations are passed through Parliament, which can mean a long waiting period. So unlike a typical bylaw that can happen a lot quicker, the national park regulations bylaw has to go through Parliament and that could take quite a while. So it can also be challenging to have regulations approved and in place. So to make up for the lack of lighting bylaws, Jasper actually has decided to use a voluntary approach. So Jasper offers lighting rebates as an incentive for residents to change their lighting. And overall, the town of Jasper was quite supportive of becoming a dark sky preserve. So the people who live in Jasper actually love the natural beauty and they fully support environmental initiatives. And there's actually been no resident so far that has been obligated to change their lighting through policy. So no one is forced to change lighting just because it is a dark sky preserve, but it is really encouraged to do so. And these changes therefore have been voluntary. So if residents were responsible for the expense of changing their own lighting, the town would receive major opposition. So instead, the plan is to offer rebates, education, and promotion to address this issue. 
The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has requested that JASPER retrofit their lighting, but there was also no strict timeline given. So even though the application was approved, they have a little bit of time here to change the lighting. So even if you are considering putting a dark sky site in your municipality, once you put the application in, there is actually time to make these changes down the road. The next dark sky site that I will talk about is Canada's first international dark sky community. And this place is called Bon Accord, which is in Alberta. And what's interesting about Bon Accord is I've talked about two places that were designated by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, but Bon Accord is actually designated by the International Dark Sky Association in the United States. So what's great about the IDA is that they actually offer dark sky designations throughout the world. It's not just primarily in the U.S. So Bon Accord was designated by the IDA in 2015. The decision to undertake this initiative was to provide the town with a specific niche to attract people, residents, and growth in the area. So what's interesting about a dark sky community is it actually creates a unique type of tourist attraction and as well it's an economic generator. So Bon Accord is actually a very, very small place, so it gives the town a very unique sort of identity having this dark sky designation. So dark sky designations provide a reason for people to visit Bon Accord as many dark sky designations are primarily in reserves and parks. So as you can imagine, it would probably be a lot harder having a city or a town become a dark sky place just because there's a lot more work in terms of residential lighting and street lighting compared to that of a park or a national park. So what makes a dark sky community designation different than a dark sky park or a preserve? While parks can be controlled by provincial or federal jurisdiction, a dark sky community requires community support through policies, bylaws, and public education. So one of the questions I asked in my interviews was, how has Bon Accord met dark sky lighting requirements? So Bon Accord has updated policies, bylaws, and they've developed a grant for residents who apply for dark sky lighting. If residents apply for dark sky lighting, they will receive a 50% matching grant funding financial incentive. But this is similar to Jasper in the sense that the community is encouraging people through financial incentives and rebates to change the lighting. Also, to keep the dark sky designation, there's an ongoing maintenance like month monthly monitoring light emissions. So the council and city staff supported dark sky designation and voted unanimously to pass a designation and create a dark sky bylaw. And before the bylaw was passed, Bon Accord educated the town with social media and newsletters. And since the bylaw has been created, there's actually appeared for residents to change their lighting to meet dark sky standards. So this is quite similar to Jasper, that there's a period after designation that there's a chance for these changes of lighting to happen later. One of the challenges, though, is that there's not enough money available to make these changes quickly. And the bylaw will allow for some use to pass before the lighting changes must be in effect. And what's also interesting is that the lighting bylaw impacts both residential and commercial areas. And another question I asked was, has Bon Accord had any issues with crime and safety? Well, Bon Accord was certain that crime would not increase because the lights in town actually do not reduce illumination, but rather they work within the lighting spectrum. This kind of goes back to some of the stuff we discussed in the first course. It's about picking the right color temperature and the right type of lighting, but it doesn't mean there is no lighting, but it's just a specific type of, type of lighting that's going to meet a dark sky town requirement. There's been no linkages in Bon Accord that is found between dark sky lighting and crime in town, and the goal is not to turn lights off, but to reduce the amount of light that goes up into the night sky. The last dark sky site that I'm going to be discussing is Mont Megantic. So Mont Megantic is an international dark sky reserve in Quebec, Canada. It was also designated by the IDA as well, even though it's located in Canada. And what's really interesting is that Mont Megantic is the third largest observatory used for scientific purpose in Canada. In 1996, the Astrolab opened in the observatory, and the goal of the Astrolab was to make science accessible and incorporate astronomy, geology, biology, and ecology. In the IDA designation, it contributed to the development of a new regional expertise in outdoor lighting management at Mont Megantic. And as a result of this, the Dark Sky Reserve's 34 municipalities have developed outdoor lighting regulations that have contributed to the control and limited growth of light pollution in the area. So that means the nearby towns and places close to Mont Megantic also took a commitment to improving their lighting to make sure that the Mont Megantic was protected from artificial lighting to preserve the dark skies and make astronomical viewing at the observatory better. So in my interviews, I asked, why did Mont Megantic choose to become a dark sky reserve? Well, the reason here is that there was a scientific report from the Astrolab, which showed an increase in light pollution. And this set up the precedent to ensure the Astrolab and National Park were not impacted by light pollution, and this inspired the creation of a dark sky reserve. 
So the initiative to actually become a dark sky reserve at Mount Megantic started in 2003, and it was officially designated in 2007. So it took a little while longer than some of the places that I mentioned that had a one-year application. And I also asked, how much did it cost to turn Mount Megantic into a dark sky reserve? The project expense was approximately $1.5 million, but the majority of the cost actually went to project staff. Also, light conversions were needed. There were significant costs for converting old lighting to dark sky compliant lighting, and this involved changing over 3,000 lighting fixtures 25 kilometers around the park. In terms of issues of crime and safety, since its dark sky reserve designation, Mont Megantic has actually not noticed an increase in crime. So like all the other dark sky sites I've discussed so far, none of them have actually noticed any problems of crime and safety. I also was told one of the lessons that Mont Megantic learned since becoming a dark sky site, which I think is quite important to share. And the lesson is that a dark sky site cannot be designated with the expectation that will remain the same as the effort will always be required for improved lighting efficiency and bylaws. So the lesson from Mount Megantic is that even after becoming a dark sky site designation, there's always going to be changes and alterations that need to be done to keep the park up to date with being a dark sky place. So once you become a dark sky site, there's always ongoing effort to do. Now that we have explored stories from dark sky sites, we will take a look at implementing a lighting ordinance.